the crew line up the giant Airbus for the final approach. Landing gear down and locked. Three green. No flaps. Only the emergency brakes. No spoilers, no reverse thrust. 4,000 feet, 195 knots. Three thousand feet, one hundred and ninety seven knots. Two thousand feet, two hundred knots. Alert to cabin. Cabin crew, one minute to landing. Vertical speed at 3,000 feet per minute. We're going way too fast. And the speed's increasing, 203 knots now. It's way too fast. 1,000 feet, 201 knots. We're trying to get the nose up. We're right fast. But even if the crew can get the Airbus on the runway, they face a further problem. Without engines, the normal procedures for braking are severely restricted. The danger is far from over. The pilots must land the plane without power and somehow get it to stop. hits hard at high speed. The tires have blown! Captain Pichet tries to hold the nose down. After bursting eight tires, the plane finally stops in the middle of the runway. I just wanted to get out of this airplane quickly. I jumped, I hit the ground hard. It's my, I don't think my, my rear end actually even touched the chute at all. I didn't slide down the slide. I ran down it. And they're just, get out, get out, get out. So you're just running out of this aircraft. What in God's name just happened? I, I, I fell down to the ground, literally, and I just started, I started crying. I mean, once you're off the plane and you're evacuated, you want to know what happened. Pichet and de Jager had flown their Airbus without power further than any passenger jet in history. As news of their remarkable achievements spread around the world, they found themselves reluctant heroes. You don't have time really to think about anything else than taking care of the, of the safety of your passenger, you know? That's your main goal, and uh, since we didn't have any engine, the other main goal was to make the landing safely. So at that time, I guess the experience came in, you know, with the help of my colleague, that's why we, that's why we made a successful landing. You train for the worst, but you never know how you'll be, deal with uh, situations like this. And um, reflecting afterwards, I feel uh, we dealt uh, in the most professional and uh, complete wa matter we could. A feeling of being grateful to see all the passengers uh, were okay. You know, something like this happened. You never know what what is going to happen. Really, I mean, you don't you stop not to believe it. I mean. Uh, Makes no sense that a big jet with two engines has no more power with 300 people on board, you know. But although the public story was of success, disturbing questions remained. Why had a highly sophisticated airliner run out of fuel? What exactly had happened to Flight 236? Away from the cameras, an accident investigation began immediately by the Portuguese, Canadian, and French transport authorities. 
Initial checks quickly confirmed that all the fuel tanks of the Airbus were indeed empty. But to lose more than 17 tons of fuel in such a short space of time meant they had a major leak. The question was where? Engineers examined the fuel system searching for faults in the tanks and the fuel lines. It wasn't long before they found what they were looking for, just by the right engine. In this particular case, you had a hydraulic tube that's relatively small by comparison to the larger fuel tube. And the hydraulic tube, due possibly to pulsations in the hydraulic system, were abrading against the larger tube. And eventually the larger tube uh, had a leak in it, and the leak, or not the leak itself, but the, uh, the hole eventually possibly led into a fracture of the tube, allowing this massive fuel flow outside of the engine. The investigators began checking Air Transat maintenance records. They discovered that on the 19th of August, five days before the flight, Air Transat had removed the right-hand engine for maintenance and installed a replacement unit sent by Rolls-Royce. But as they analyzed the repair logs for the engine, they uncovered a shocking mistake. This was not a case of faulty design, but of faulty maintenance. Rolls-Royce had supplied the engine without a hydraulic pump assembly. To overcome this, Transat mechanics had used the parts from an older engine. But they didn't fit properly, and the pipes had been rubbing together for five days. Until midway over the Atlantic, one finally broke. The engine was delivered minus these two tubes and a bracket. That The purpose of that bracket was to maintain adequate clearance. So if they took the bracket off the old engine and put it on the new engine, is that the pipes would be locked together so that they could possibly abrade. As investigators questioned Air Transat mechanics, they found more disturbing evidence of malpractice. The chief mechanic testified that he had been concerned about the substitution of another hydraulic assembly. Five days before the accident, he raised his concerns with his superior. The company decided that the aircraft must go back into service and could not wait for the missing parts. He should go ahead with the substitution. The replacement parts only differed from the correct ones by a few millimeters, but it was a difference that nearly cost 306 lives. A few days after the accident, Air Transat publicly accepted responsibility for the faulty maintenance. We have to realize that there was a small uh, a mistake uh, made uh, in terms of changing the pump. Uh, we installed it, uh, but then uh, some, some, some uh, pipes, uh, so to speak, uh, were needed to be connected to the pump, and there was a mismatch. The immediate consequences for Air Transat in that event was that they got to pay a fine of a quarter of a million dollar, which was the highest ever in Canada, for an error that could have been prevented. How someone that is supposed to be qualified in their job can put the wrong part onto an engine and risk 300 people's lives is, is, is beyond me. This incident is a very strong reminder that regulation is important and safety is important and lives will be lost in the absence of that. And they're real lives. It's not just, you know, this imaginary figure in your head of 300 people. It's real people who suffer and continue to suffer. As a result. If it hadn't been us suffering, it would have been our families. This was by no means the end of the story. Investigators now turned their attention to the cockpit itself. And what role had the crew played in the events of August 24th? Could they have done more to avert the crisis? Key questions remained unanswered. Questions about what happened on the flight deck. transport